Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, the first poet that we look into the romantic period is William Wordsworth. He was born in 1770 and died in 1850 and it was he and uh, Coleridge who uh, announced this romantic movement. We will see the romantic poets together in one slide then we will see the map of Lake District because many of these poets were called Lake District poets or Lake poets. The prominent of this lake poet is um, uh, Wordsworth. We will see some of the poetic forms experimented by Wordsworth, then uh, pay attention to prefaced lyrical ballads which we mentioned earlier in the previous uh, video and now pay attention to the prelude from which we have book 1 for our discussion. Even from this book 1, we have certain selected passages in this lecture and in the next lecture we will see some more selected passages and complete this discussion of words with poetry. Romantic movement has several dimensions, political, literary, linguistic, thematic, technical, landscape and even one idea called undercurrent. Politically, American revolution in 1776, French revolution in 1789 create a climate where there was a desire for a radically democratic society. And in literature, poets took interest in nature and they reacted against the stereotypical and elitist culture of poetic diction and tone of the previous era. In language, they chose to write about common people in ordinary language. When it comes to themes, they chose subjects from rural, poor areas, simple people uh, living in community or in common areas and they were also thinking about people's relation to spirituality and the ability of nature to nurture them in an environment where there was some universal peace and all that. Now, when we move to technical aspect of romantic movement, we find that poets were experimenting in line and stanza forms in subjects in their interaction between man and nature. They brought in lots of landscape into their poetry, hills, dales, rivers, streams, plants, flowers, everything that they could see from outside. And the major undercurrent of romantic poetry is the relationship between man and nature and the interaction between mind and the natural processes. They noticed close resemblance between whatever is happening in nature and whatever happened in their own mind. Here we have the list of romantic poets, William Blake, William Wordsworth, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Robert Southey, Lord Byron, Percy Bysshe Shelley, John Keats. First three were called Lake Poets, Wordsworth, Coleridge and Southey and we can see that it was Wordsworth who lived the longest and it was John Keats who lived for a short period of time, but all of them produced great poetry which we cherish today. This is the map of uh, the Lake District, certain key points we have, locations we have, Cockermouth, Pendrith, Windermere, Grassmere, Derwent, Est White and Woolswater. The lakes are indicated through blue color, we can see many lakes are there and Wordsworth and his friends they were living here for some time and they were moving around walking in nature, breathing in nature, living with nature and drawing inspiration from nature to write poetry about themselves and nature. To give a brief introduction to Wordsworth, he was motherless at 8 and fatherless at 13 that impacted his life. He was supported by relatives and friends. With all that he was able to get education in Cambridge and he developed certain natural revolutionary thoughts because of the spirit of the age and he was able to make lasting friendship with Coleridge and he was lucky that he had his sister Dorothy most of the times with him and she was always inspiring him to write poems. Similarly, when he married uh, this lady Mary 
she was managing many of the activities of Wordsworth. In later life, Wordsworth was able to get disposed of distributor of stamps, only then he was able to become financially a little independent and then after the death of Robert Saudi, he became poet laureate. The poem that we discuss, the, the poem for which he is known as a great epic poet in English poetry was published only after his death in 1850, that too by his wife. The title The Prelude also was given by his wife. Many short poems we have where they are well known, but this one The Prelude which he wrote throughout his life, which he revised throughout his life was published only after his death. Wordsworth experimented with different kinds of poetic forms. To begin with, he was using the blank words in his poems, in most of his poems. He was also drawing on this ballad tradition. One example is Simon Lee. He was writing from this pastoral setting as we have in Michael. He was experimenting with the sonnet form as we have in London 1802. Then many of his poems are lyrical. Two examples we have, My Heart Lips Up and Tintin Abbey. Uh, he also worked with the word form in intimations of immortality. Elegy also he tried in elegiac stanzas and lastly we have this epic. One of the uh, innovative epics in English is the prelude, an autobiographical epic. What do we have in the preface to lyrical ballads? We hinted at some points earlier. Now, we will see some more points about the lyrical ballads, particularly the preface to lyrical ballads. We will raise questions like, who is a poet? According to Wordsworth, a poet is a man speaking to man, not speaking to conventions, not speaking to elite society. What is poetry? According to Wordsworth, poetry is spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings recollected in tranquility. What are the subjects useful for writing poems? According to Wordsworth, common people are good enough for writing about in their poetry. Uh, landscape is good, countryside is good, uh, rivers and valleys, they are all suitable for poetry in Wordsworth. When it comes to the region which he explored, the mind and heart of man in nature, mind, mind and heart of man, not in isolation, not away from nature, but in nature. What is the aim of writing poems? Didactic aim, Wordsworth that is why he is considered to be a somewhat difficult a poet in the sense. Uh, he was not writing great poetry. Some people may not like his poetry because he was giving some message. But for him and many readers of poetry throughout the world, we like him because of some message, some healing power that is therapeutic power that we have in his poetry. The kind of language that Wordsworth wanted to use was the language of the common man, not of Latinate language, not of Greek language, poetic diction as Pope and Dryden were using. The rhythm also he drew from the common speech patterns of people. Actually, he was walking around his own place and many places along with Coleridge and other poets. He observed people speaking and took the speech patterns from the people and introduced them into his own poetry. For him, figures of speech should be functional, not ornamental as in the case of previous uh, poets. And for him, the best model for writing poetry is nature herself. That is why in most of the poems, he writes about nature or human beings in nature. The poem that we want to discuss here is the prelude. It has 14 books. We are not going to look into all those 14 books. We will have only one book that is the first book. Here we have some preliminary information about the prelude. Wordsworth considered this poem to be an introduction to a long philosophical poem called The Recluse or Views of Nature, Man and Society. He wrote this poem in different forms from 1798 to 1832. Over a long period of time he was writing it. Mostly this poem was chronological and Wordsworth spent his whole lifetime to revise it again and again. The theme of the poem is his own self. There are many titles for this poem, poem to Coleridge, poem on the growth of a poet's mind, 
poem on my own life, poem title not yet fixed upon. The last one, the fifth one is the prelude or the growth of a poet's mind that is the title that we have now for this poem. It was given by his own wife Mary Wordsworth after his death. The prelude an epic poem has 14 books. Book 1 has 23 verse paragraphs and it deals primarily with childhood and school time. He discusses the new found freedom to settle down in one place called Grasmere. He also discusses his commitment to the long poem addressed to Coleridge in this book 1. He explores many themes, what kind of theme that he can choose to write about in this poem, whether he should choose subject from mythical uh, stories or historical events or his own self, he considers many options. Then he also examines his own uh, potential, how much of talent that he has to write about all these different kinds of subjects. Finally, he chooses one option that is a tale from his own heart that he considers to be his main option. Then when he starts writing, he starts writing about his own childhood the way in which he lived as a child in nature and he finds a close relationship between him and nature. He calls it foundational relationship for the man that he grew to be, for the poet that he became. The places that he lived around River Devon, Skida Mountain, Hakshad School, Lake Ulswater, Yes Dwight Valley, all these are projected in book 1. He deals with two different kinds of activities, outdoor activities and indoor games. He learnt many things from both outdoor and indoor activities, he deals with them. A major incident that is discussed in book 1 is boat incident and he deals with this uh, in quite a few lines, we will see them. And also he discusses playing cards that is indoor game, uh, we also have some focus on this. Finally, he chooses the theme of his own self as the story of my life that is going to be the subject of the autobiographical poem that he writes and he says when he gets this kind of confidence he says the road lies plain before me let me write about my own life, my own story, my own self in this prelude. We have the opening lines, we have to remember that this is an epic poem, an autobiographical epic poem, an autobiographical epic poem begins with an invocation, these are the opening lines. Oh, there is blessing in this gentle breeze, a waste hand that while it fans my cheek, that seem half conscious of the joy it brings from the green fields and from yon azure sky. Whatever its mission, the soft breeze can come to none more grateful than to me, escaped from the vast city where I long had pined, a discontented sojourner, now free, free as a bird to settle where I will, what dwelling shall receive me, in what vale shall be my arbor underneath, what grove shall I take up my home and what clear stream shall with its murmur lull me into rest, the earth is all before me. This is how he begins and the kind of interaction that he has with the breeze and the kind of it, uh, freedom that it gives him is visible in these uh, lines, opening lines. What is important for Wordsworth is the liberty, the freedom that he has got. So, he addresses liberty directly, dear liberty, yet what would it avail but for a gift that consecrates the joy, for I methought while the sweet breath of heaven was blowing on my body felt within a correspondent breeze that gently moved with quickening virtue what is now become a tempest, a redundant energy vexing its own creation. Thanks to both and their congenial powers that while they join in breaking up a long continued frost, bring with them vernal promises, the hope of active days urged on by flying hours, days of sweet leisure taxed with patient thought, abstruse not wanting punctual service high, matins and whispers harmonious verse. Wordsworth is able to see this harmonious verse from his interaction with the correspondent breeze that happens in him in his own mind that is the inspiration. When there is a gentle breeze in the nature, there is a breeze in him which inspires him to find out the relations between day and night, 
morning and evening, man and nature, he feels liberated, he feels happy that he could uh, write his own poem. We have to remember that the whole poem was written for Coleridge, his friend. So, he addresses his friend. Thus far, O oh friend, did I not use to make a present joy the matter of a song, pour forth that day my soul in measured strains that would not be forgotten and are here recorded. To the open fields I told a prophecy, poetic numbers came spontaneously to clothe in priestly robe, a renovated spirit singled out. Such hope was mine for holy services, my own voice cheered me and for more the mind's internal echo of the imperfect sound to both I listen, drawing from them both a cheerful confidence in things to come. Wordsworth was able to see this harmonious verse taking shape in his own mind and then he addresses his own friend Coleridge, poetic numbers came spontaneously. When Wordsworth was in the right mind, in the right place with this liberal feeling, sense of freedom, sense of freedom that he got when he came to Grasmere, he was able to write this poem cheerfully. He was able to get support from natural surroundings a cheerful confidence in things to come established here for Wordsworth. Poetry and tree, yes, there is a close relationship between poetry and tree as specified by Wordsworth here in these lines. Content and not willing now to give a respite to this passion, I paced on with brisk and eager steps and came at length to a green shady place, where down I sat beneath a tree, slackening my thoughts by choice and settling into gentler happiness. It was autumn and a clear placid day, with warmth as much as needed, from a sun two hours declined towards the west, a day with silver clouds and sunshine on the grass and in the shelter and the sheltering grove, a perfect stillness. When we go to nature, when we sit under a tree, we have this sense of stillness, a perfect stillness, a kind of calm, peace, quietness that we feel happy about and we are sheltered in the sheltering grove. This shelter, security, sense of security, sense of being with nature is what gives cheerful confidence to Wordsworth. Poetry is not just poetry, it is powerful poetry when it is written spontaneously sitting under a tree or at least imagining and sitting under a tree or getting the bliss of the breeze from the tree into the heart and mind, the poem pours out for his friend Coleridge. Now let us see the poet, what does he think about himself? And now it would content me to yield up those lofty hopes a while for present gifts or humble industry, but oh dear friend, the poet, gentle creature as he is, hath like the lover his unruly times, his fits when he is neither sick nor well, though no distress be near him but his own, unmanageable thoughts, his mind best pleased, while she as duteous as the mother dove sits brooding, lives not always to that end, but like the innocent bird hath goadings on that drive her as in trouble through the groves. With me is now such passion to be blamed no otherwise than as it lasts too long. The poet, who is the poet? The poet is like the lover. Very often the poet and the lover, they get unmanageable thoughts in themselves. What to do with themselves? becomes a difficult situation for them and Wordsworth because he was not able to get a subject, proper subject to write the poem to his friend, many times he had some difficulties and he had to overcome those difficulties, those unmanageable thoughts and now he is able to do it after coming to Grasmere. Wordsworth explores many themes in this uh, section. We will settle on some British theme, some old romantic tale by Milton left unsung. How Wallace fought for Scotland, left the name of Wallace to be found like a wild flower, 
all over his dear country left the deeds of Wallace like a family of ghosts to people the steep rocks and river banks, her natural sanctuaries with a local soul of independence and stern liberty. Sometimes it suits me better to invent a tale from my own heart more near akin to my own passions and habitual thoughts. This is a typical problem that every writer will come across what to write about. Wordsworth in his own case thought about historical themes or mythical themes or legendary themes or some themes left by other poets like Milton not yet written about and here in this passage Wordsworth mentions about William Wallace a, a knight who fought for the independence of Scotland. Imagine the spirit of Wallace lying all over Scotland, all over the country in different forms Wallace fought for Scotland and then left the name of Wallace to be found like a wild flower all over his dear country, left the deeds of Wallace like a family of ghosts to people the steep rocks and river banks, her natural sanctuaries everywhere, he, a local soul of independence and stern liberty. The spirit of liberty was given to Scotland people because of his fight for the independence of Scotland from Britain long long ago in 13th century and that 13th century night is remembered even today and similarly Wordsworth is thinking about some spirit of independence from some source for his poetry and finally he thinks I shall I think about a tale from my own heart that is invent a tale from my own heart. Invention is a key to writing poetry and here that invention comes from his own imagination thinking about his own life from his own childhood. He continues the themes, the experiments or the explorations he continues in this passage. Some variegated story in the main lofty, but the unsubstantial structure melts before the very sun that brightens it, mist into air dissolving, then a wish my last and favorite aspiration mounts with yawning towards some philosophic song of truth that cherishes our daily life with meditations passionate from deep recesses in man's heart, immortal verse, thoughtfully fitted to the Orphean lyre. But from this awful burden, I full soon take refuge and beguile myself with trust that mellower years will bring a riper mind and clearer insight. It is a matter of time for Wordsworth to get into his own heart, the innermost parts of the mind and heart he would be able to discover some thoughts for his own poems. River Devon played a major role in shaping Wordsworth's imagination. So, he addresses River Darwin here in this passage. Was it for this that one the fairest of all rivers loved to blend his murmurs with my nurse's song and from his alder shades and rocky falls and from his fords and shallows sent a voice that flowed along my dreams. For this didst thou, O Darwin, winding among grassy homes where I was looking on a babe in arms, make ceaseless music that composed my thoughts to more than infant softness giving me amid the fretful dwellings of mankind a foretaste, a dim earnest of the calm that nature breathes among the hills and groves. Repeatedly Wordsworth is pointing to the calm, peaceful quality of stillness that he can get to manage his own thoughts, to put them together and write some poems. And here Darwin like a mother has actually sang lullaby for him to get that kind of peace and quietness. In this poem, in this uh, autobiographical poem, epic poem, we can see this kind of thematic contrast. Wordsworth is able to find blessing, he is able to notice the, the difference between gentle rough aspects of nature, the conscious and unconscious aspects of nature and his own mind. He is able to contrast city and village. In this village environment, rural environment, he is able to get this inspiration, contentment or discontentment, free and constrained mind, home and homeless feeling, restful and restless feeling, liberty and restriction, virtue and vice, creation and destruction, hope and despair, harmony and disharmony, joy and sorrow, 
spontaneous and studied stillness and motion normal and mad that is poet and lover innocent and mature old and new truth and untruth heart and head clear and confused dream and reality that imagination and reality these are the various kinds of contrasts that we can see in the selected passages that we have looked into this poem he is able to get blessing he, uh, we have highlighted those aspects which wordsworth considers to be valuable for him like blessing uh, unconscious uh, exploration the rustic environment liberty that he feels the virtue of being in a rural environment the kind of creation uh, creative thought that he gets the hope and harmony that he finds the spontaneous flow from him writing for his friend and the innocence the truth heart the dream of life that uh, writing his own poem that he presents to us many poetic devices can be found here we have noted down questions and anaphora personification apostrophe allusion epic simile personification in all these cases we have seen when it comes to questions we have many here what dwelling shall receive me in what vale shall be my harbor underneath what grove shall i take up my home and what clear stream shall with its murmur lull me into rest this is a series of questions and within these questions we have one word beginning uh, the question what and this is repeated in many places that's why we call it uh, anaphora and also shall 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 that also can speak can be considered uh, an example of this anaphora the same word begins every line here when it comes to personification it's uh, notable to see that the gentle breeze is considered to be a human being or a divine being which blesses wordsworth next we have this apostrophe in many places he addresses his friend and also liberty in two cases we have allusion to shakespeare's play where we have this comparison between the poet and the lover and next we have this simile epic simile if we paid attention to this how william wallace was spreading like a wild flower throughout his country and how he is remembered even today and lastly we saw this personification of river devon like a mother river devon taught many things to wordsworth now when we see this rhyme rhythm and meter we notice that there is no end rhyme because it is written in blank verse we can see some assonance and alliteration assonance in the case of the heavy weight of many a weary day heavy weight weary day and in the case of alliteration we can see proud spring tide swellings for a regular sea in line number 167 we have highlighted this yes 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 that is a case of alliteration the meter of this uh, particular poem is unrhymed iambic pentameter we have uh, lots of examples for sisura in jam and in stopped line we have just one example here long months of ease and undisturbed delight are mine in prospect whether shall i turn by road or pathway or through tr trackless field up hill or down or shall some floating thing upon the river point me out my course on the whole we have a good impression of wordsworth's uh, poem here wordsworth invokes the blessing of the gentle and correspondent breeze to help him write the philosophical poem he promised for his friend coleridge he has come to grasmere to engage with the task of completing this poem he discusses the possible themes for his grand poem from history and mythology finally he decides to write about his own life and introduce a new form of epic in english he starts off with childhood experiences in lake district the rivers hills lakes especially river devon a playmate and a mother the poet is like a pilgrim looking for rest inspiration to complete his journey of the epic poem he has promised for his friend in summary we have seen the romantic movement the list of romantic poets lake district map and we found something about wordsworth's own life a fatherless motherless child how he was able to shape himself uh, in association with uh, nature in association with other people 
and how he experimented with various forms like ballad, ode, epic and other things. We paid attention to the preface uh, to lyrical ballads where he has defined the role of poet, language, poetic diction and all that and we specifically moved on to the prelude and examined book 1 particularly some selected passages from line number 1 to 2, 82 we saw and we will see the rest of the uh, book 1 in the next lecture. We analyze the poem using the proposed methodology that we have adopted for this particular course, thematic contrast, poetic devices, rhyme, rhythm, meter and uh, overall impression. Some references are here, those of you who are interested in reading more about uh, Wordsworth's uh, poetry can understand something more from these references in addition to the poem that we have read. Thank you.